You're listening to Blue Collar CEO, the podcast that's all about helping you build a better, more profitable, and more sustainable home service business. Each week, we'll cover a different topic that will help enable your company to move forward to success. And here's your host, Ryan Redding. What is up, Blue Collar CEOs? It's Ryan. It is awesome to be with you today. I'm getting ready to introduce you to Jason with Newberry Franklin Home Services. Uh, he is a CEO and co-founder. He owns several locally led uh, concierge maintenance businesses in a high-end markets across the country. So imagine all these places that you would go to on, on nice vacations. That could be Boston. They could be the Jersey Shore, things like this, uh, San Diego. This is the type of business that he runs uh, residential management services for. Uh, this is his first real job in the private sector ever. He's spent the past 15 years of his career. He's been in the Marines. He's been a director and CEO, COO of a nonprofit. Uh, he's done all kinds of things. He even like, co-wrote a book. So the dude's been all over the map. Uh, but he's really big on scaling an unconventional and novel business idea in unconventional ways. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things. One of the things he mentioned that's actually kind of unique for the show is OKRs. If you don't know what OK, OKRs are, OKRs are, uh, you're going to want to pay attention because we get into it a little bit. Fascinating conversation. Let me introduce you to Jason. Hey, Jason, it is good to have you on again. We tried to do this before. We had technical difficulties, which is kind of a pain in the ass, but here we are. Uh, for those who don't yet know who you are, let's just maybe start there, man. Who are you and what do you do? Yeah, uh, Jason Mandone. I'm the CEO of Newberry Franklin Home Services, which is a nationwide provider of concierge home maintenance services in seven, soon to be eight markets across the country. Um, do you want me to do a little bit of my background as well or no? Yeah, why not? Because I'm sure that there's boys and girls listening who are like, how do you get into that? Because that seems like a weird place to just kind of like start. Yeah. I, yeah. So I didn't just start here, although it was a little bit happenstance. So like, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my backstory uh, with a focus on how I ended up in this specific industry. Uh, so graduated from Boston College in 2006. After that, uh, was an infantry officer of the Marine Corps for a little bit. Uh, ran a nonprofit for a few years, uh, had a few other jobs to include. I helped to write a book uh, that came out in 2018. Um, long story short, uh, it was 2020. Um, I the, the nonprofit that I had mentioned that I had run, um, I had helped lead it through a merger with two other nonprofits. On the back end of the merger, I had been the COO, um, and their CEO job was up. Uh, uh, and, um, like I had basically set myself on a career path and had entered that interview process and had told myself, like, I'm going to go back to this nonprofit, I'm going to run it. Um, and that's going to be my life's work. Like my professional contribution to the world will be CEO of this nonprofit. Um, and then I finished in second place in the interview process. Uh, and I was sort of down in the dumps, but it forced me to think about like, what's really, really important to me right now. Um, and, and it sort of came to, to two things. Uh, personally, it was really, really important to me to raise my family in the same place I was raised, which I'm right now sitting in my basement in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, so that was thing number one. Thing number two, from a professional perspective, I was ready to like be fully 100% accountable for something again and uh, be able to practice hands-on leadership in the same way that I had been fortunate to do in my early 20s when I was in the military. And so I set out on this path to find a company to buy um, and uh, raise a little bit of money with some partners uh, and found this business in Southern New Jersey called C. Alexander Building and Maintenance. Uh, and our acquisition of that business in June of 2020 got us into what we call the, the concierge maintenance industry, so, which I'm sure we'll get into what that is and what the business has become since then, yeah, but bottom I line, guess. yeah, I'm I'm in this job because I wanted to raise my family in New Jersey, and I really, really missed hands-on leadership. That totally makes sense, and kind of what a weird, like I say, weird, like it's an unconventional, like it's not a linear path, you know, like, no. um, it, like the Marines is a great example where it's like it's typically a linear sort of progression, right? You yeah. do this, and then you escalate up, and you get promoted to this, and you kind of move up. You're like zigzagging all over the place to to like geographically find yourself in a spot. So I do, I do want to unpack a bit because when, when a lot of people listening to the show right now, 
we have a lot of plumbing, HVAC, electrical, like landscape, uh, remodel, like of course, asphalt guys. Listen, when they think of home services, they have a certain sort of like of course meaning that they encode yep. in that phrase. That uh, arguably, I would make the critique that most most like an average person on the street has no idea what that means, right? It's just Correct. Like, oh, okay. So when you say home services, I think you mean it in a way that's different than like an average plumber might hear it. Yeah. So when, when you say home services, like what do you mean by that? Yeah. So uh, like I'll talk about, so like the name of the company is Newberry Franklin Home Services. But as I mentioned, like our initial acquisition was this business in Southern New Jersey called C. Alexander Building and Maintenance. So to like talk about what the business is, I'll focus on that business to provide a, a, a window on the on everything that we do. So C. Alexander Building Maintenance manages 250 uh, second homes uh, on the Jersey Shore. Not like the fist pumping MTV show part of the Jersey Shore, but like if any of your There's listeners- There's another should, part of the Jersey I know, Shore? I thought all, that was the only of, one. All of it basically except for a couple of towns uh, like Seaside Heights and Wildwood are, are quite beautiful. Um, uh, and Seaside Heights, and Wildwood. except for Seaside Heights. Well, by the way, Seaside and Wildwood are both beautiful. Don't get me wrong, but like, like they're especially beautiful for young twenty-somethings that want to go out and party and have a good time. They're great, uh, but there's like ninety percent of the Jersey Shore is like is like families. Um, and Got so okay. this this particular market that we're in, um, we manage two hundred fifty second homes. Uh, like the average dollar value of the home that we manage is about $1.8 million. Uh, and and when we say concierge maintenance, you basically get two things. One is uh, in exchange for a monthly membership fee, uh, we you get a set of recurring services. In the case of a second home, that recurring service is a weekly house check. So you walk through your house, go through an inspection checklist, email it to you and send you any pictures if there's any issues. Second, and sort of the core of the business, is we allow to completely outsource the care of the home. So when you're one of our members, rather than needing to call the plumber, the landscaper, the HVAC guy, and so on yourself, you call us and we manage that subcontractor coming to your home for you and then send you a consolidated bill for the entirety of your home care uh, twice a month. So the, the core of our business is we, we allow our members and their families to outsource their home's care so that way they can relax in their home. And then since then, we've had like a little bit of a pivot, like as I mentioned over the over the last year or so, I spent the first year and a half, two years in the business, just working in C. Alexander every day. And then we've also acquired a couple other businesses in other places in New Jersey. Over the last six months, we've started to grow. I mentioned into Charleston, Hilton Head, uh, San Diego, Philadelphia. And uh, in, a, in about six weeks, we open up in Boston. Um, uh, so we're not exclusively second homes now. We also do primary residences. The only difference in the business model is that for the monthly fee, if you're a primary resident, uh, you don't get house checks because you're presumably living in the home. You get yeah, like you get like a set of quarterly recurring services like dryer vent cleaning, gutter cleaning, so forth and so on. Um, and uh, here's one of the kids that I really wanted to move down to New Jersey for. Can you say hi, Anthony? All right, can you go outside, man? <laughs> I love I love having these conversations come in like off. actual people's houses because actual life happens. It's so yeah. much fun to like watch this. Well, the the one of the positive upsides of COVID is that I feel like no one freaks out anymore when little kids jump into the background. It just sort of happens. I freak out when my kids come in. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because you're a horrible parent, Ryan. No, just, the uh, uh... <laughs> honestly, you are not the first person to say that to me today. You are oh, not the first person to date. Oh uh, yeah. Now, I thank you for your grace on that. I um, thanks for letting me deal with that. No, I mean, dude, you're always a parent. It's always on. And yeah. honestly, the legacy you have on on your kids is going to far outlast anything else. So it's super important. Yeah, no one of the one of the questions I always ask people when they're sounding particularly ambitious is, uh, "Hey, do you know who the eighth vice president of the United States is?" Like, and the point is, like, I don't. I've never met anyone that does. And like, presumably that was the second most important person in the country at some point in the early 19th century. And like, no one remembers who the hell they are. Uh, so anyway, like I, I, I'm excited to build a business, but yeah, like the, the kids are all that really matters. No, oh, totally get it, man. It yeah. uh, absolutely does. So like, so it sounds like the way you describe it, maybe, maybe for those who are still getting their head around the model or at least the business practice, would it be fair to say like, Hey, and in, in a way that there might be a, a property or building manager for 
for apartment complexes or for commercial facilities. You kind of do these for residences uh, specifically, primarily for second homes. But in some cases, they're primary and almost like you handle. Uh, would it be fair to say like you handle like the maintenance and kind of management of those those properties too? So where an HVAC company might come out and say, hey, we're going to do an annual maintenance package. We're going to come out to four times a year, whatever, do X, Y, Z. Uh, you essentially run that role. You are actually doing the sites. You're actually doing those particular services. And if work does need to be required, now you're bringing in these other these other contractors as subs, essentially. That, that yeah. Right? So like, yeah, a really couple like pithy ways just to break it down is like one, yes, we're a property manager, but as opposed to a rental or commercial building, we do it for a mostly you know, like a single family residence. Another way to sort of visualize it is that each of our members gets what's called a weekly update email for their property once a week. And it lists holistically all the work that's been completed in their home over the last 90 days across every service category, as well as all the work that's scheduled in their home over the coming 90 days. Um, and, and the point there is like our differentiator, what we do is we give you a holistic view on the service status of your home. Like we're, we're the single person who like who can, knows when there's a problem, uh, really, really cares when there's a problem and can come up with a plan to fix it regardless if it's an HVAC issue, a landscaping issue, a housekeeping issue, what, whatever it is, we're, we're that holistic provider of services. So when you're, when you're running a business like this, in your case, it's interesting because you have uh, the business sounds like it has like geographic sort of hubs, right? Because the way that you're growing is by planting like, Hey, you're having like a Boston center and a San Diego center, like in just a few of these you're naming out. So now you have like a, you have, I'm assuming like one person in charge of a certain region or That's Metro. Okay. Now that they're like running service within that particular bubble of, of work, I'm guessing like hiring people, training people, onboarding people, not just like uh, employees to actually work in the business or like people to lead the business, but also probably like subs, like dealing with like, I I'm guessing you would, you would need uh, larger pools of contractors to lean on in some markets. So like, Hey, if, if, if one guy like a truck and a truck is out of town on vacation with his family you're not unable to fulfill your contractual du duties for your customers. How, like how important or how difficult maybe is it for you to find the right people in the right seats, especially as you're trying to scale and deploy this business into multiple geographies? Yeah, of course. So like, I, I think I heard a couple questions there. One was about subs and then one is like our internal organic. Yeah, talent. yeah it's a, it was yeah. a run on question. Thank yeah. you for no, the critique. <laughs> Thank you. It's cool. Um, I was just buying some time, man. The uh, <laughs> so like so to answer the simpler one too, which is which is on which is on subs. Like you you hit the nail on the head, and something that we stress with our teams all the time is that even if we're not the ones performing the work, because our value add is like giving you peace of mind with respect to the holistic care of your home. Like whether we're the whether we're doing the plumbing or not, and if it's plumbing, we're not doing the work. We're accountable for it. Uh, so identifying sub talent is particularly important for us, and um, uh, you know, while I, while I won't call them a uh, chuck in a truck, typically in a vacation community, especially, um, just because they're almost definitionally difficult to access, typically like the service providers on barrier islands, which is where a lot of our markets are, um, like you're not going to find large scaled HVAC, electrician, plumbing, and so mm, on. I see what you're saying. Um, so like, it's really, really important for us to develop excellent relationships and in our case because of the markets that we happen to be to be in those relationships are not corporate relationships they're like bob like bob runs the hvac business or in our case like a guy named pat runs the hvac business in ventnor margate in longport new jersey and if we don't keep pat happy and we don't keep pat busy and one of our members you know uh air conditioners breaks down on 4th of July weekend and it's 90 degrees, then we're, you know, then we're shit out of luck. So, so like, particularly because the markets were in interpersonal relationships with subs are super important. Um, then on the like internal talent, by far the most important thing that we do is identify, recruit, retain the human beings that run each of our individual markets in our, in our, uh, in our business that the, the title there is market president. So like there is not a Newberry Franklin Home Services corporate brand. Each company um, uh, has its own individually locally branded name. And we do that for a couple of reasons. The first is that like a, a way that we could have built our business 
would have been to like appify it and focus on really, really compelling user experience and like allow you to care for your home in an app. And there's some companies that are doing that and doing it damn well. Um, we've taken the opposite approach, which is we make sure that our technology is easy and simple for our members to use and simple for our teams to use. But our true focus is on making sure that the human being that you're interacting with is the best contractor that you've ever been in front of. So that's like, that's the white glove concierge sort that's, of descriptor, that, right? That's like exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, and you're doing means, it not for like a self-serve kiosk sort of model. It's yeah. like you have someone who is like guiding you and, and navigating you. Yeah, and, and like and there's no there's no free lunch. I mean, like we we pay our market presidents really, really damn well. Um, and you know, give them uncapped, like a very high percentage of of profit sharing. And that's part of it, but part of it to like go back to why each of our companies is locally named. If you're a market president in our company, you get to come up with the name of your business. And part of that is because, again, we want to communicate that like when you call uh, Marshside Maintenance in Hilton Head, you're not getting a call center. Like You're getting Christian Ruff, the president of Marshside Maintenance, who lives in Hilton Head with his young family. Um, the other part of that is like we want to hire people that are excited about the ownership involved with putting your name on the door. Um, so, so like where we're some tech companies and, and even recently I heard about a tech tomato farm does this too like they'll let people like to write their own job descriptions for exactly the way yeah. you're describing right they kind of like they they find that people have this ownership they have this excitement to like participate fully the retention rate of those employees is like sky high like you're basically do that but instead of it being just like hey an employee's job role like this is my title yeah like you're you're essentially giving them like that sort of ownership and influence over the business itself like the business brand and presentation the, the whole thing and and, and to be very clear like when we 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 take that to such an extreme that you know we, we were a new jersey company until the end of 2022 and now we're in south carolina pennsylvania massachusetts and california the fact that we're in those other markets um they're, they're great markets to be clear but we didn't set out and say we want to be in san diego philadelphia charleston hilton head in boston we said where's the best talent that we can find and let's make it part of our recruiting pitch to say like, hey, if we believe in you and you're in a compelling enough market, we'll let you build a, build a business in the place that you want to live. And like, g given that, frankly, like, that's the reason I'm in this business. I, I, like, as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, I, I, I got into this business primarily because it enabled me to raise my family in the place that I wanted to raise them. Telling people that, hey, like, if you're talented enough and you're right for us, we're going to let you plant the flag and pay you damn well to do it in a place of your choosing um, just allowed us to, to find a higher bar of talent than like putting the filter of specific geographies on it. At a certain point when we grow big enough, like we'll need to be more selective about our geographies, but in these early days we don't have to. And so we, we use that to our favor when we recruited. How do you, okay. So when you do the recruiting, like it, it sounds, it sounds like right now you're like talking all upside, 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 like, near unlimited revenue potential because you're going to like be super generous and rough share. Hey, name your own business, how it practices, blah, blah, even plant where you live. Great. Cool. Fine. Uh, how do you hold these people accountable? Because like at some point the, the, the success of the entire organization is dependent to like everyone kind of doing their part and everyone kind of being consistent. And there's being some amount of like brand equity. So you'd have like one superstar doing one way and then some rogue crazy nut person doing it another way. Um, not that they all need to be the same, but how do you, like, what standards do you do to make sure that people are not just rewarded for the success, but also held accountable for, for the lessons they need to learn, for the challenges they need to overcome, the mistakes that they make? Yeah, of, of course. So, like, I think we handle that sort of on, on two levels. Uh, the first level and the most important level for us is the level of values. So, like, we're very, very rigorous. Uh, like, it, it's nothing crazy. Like, we have a quarterly review process. And the most important part of that process is looking at our core values of hospi hospitality, dependability, excellence, and kindness, and asking ourselves very honestly the ways in which you're either living up to or not living up to those values. And candidly, if you're a market president and you're not living up to those values, uh, you just wouldn't be working for us for very long. And we are very, very, very deliberate in our hiring process about optimizing for those values first on the second level it's even more straightforward like each market president has specific okrs uh and the the most important ones 
are related to number of members, uh, spend per member, uh, utilization, and retention. Retention obviously matters a little bit less in year one, but in year two, it, it arguably becomes the most important one. So like it, again, it's it's nothing crazy. We're just very transparent around what our expectations are with respect to values and very uh, transparent about what our expectations are with respect to performance. Uh, and we, we hire people that like, if you're living up to our values, but like your member count isn't where it's supposed to be right now, which like candidly in three of our four new markets, our, our member count is below where we had wanted to be tracking to, but like they're all doing the right things and they're providing the right inputs and trying to catch a break. Like we can have an open and honest conversation about what you could be doing better to achieve those goals. Yeah, yeah, and and for those who who are listening who don't know, you just mentioned OKRs, and I know I I'm know sorry. a lot of guys in the trades. No, no, you're totally good because I know KPIs tends to be common for those who are yeah. to be like a little bit more sophisticated. OKR is going to be like objectives and key results. Correct. Um, so it's a little bit different than a KPI, but it's kind of a similar sort of framing. It's the same. And thing. I like how. Yeah. Well, it's it's different. Uh, we could probably get into yeah, a bit course, academic yeah. discussion, and I would want I would want a little bit more bourbon in my system <laughs> to parse that out really nerdy. But yeah, the whole point though is it's still a standard of measurement. Yeah. You can know if you're doing the right things. And, and to nerd um, out for one second, even without the bourbon at, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, the, like the, the reason that we've chosen OKRs versus KPIs is that I, I like OKRs. Um, the objective and key results, as you pointed to, is broken up into two pieces, the objective and then the key result. The objective is painting a picture of what you want the future to look like. And that picture is like inherently subjective. Um, right, right, th right. Th then, then the KR are the, what are the measurable things that you can point to as having happened or not that would make that picture that you've painted about the future actually come into being. And we like that tandem, given the sorts of people that we are hiring, um, we like to operate in a way in which we can paint a picture for you without needing to hold your hand about precisely how you're going to get there. Um, and so like given the f types of folks that we tend to hire, giving you a really, really compelling picture of where we need you to get and giving you the authority and responsibility for getting there is just a, a more aligned with our culture, the sorts of folks that we hire. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds like, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you've, you've read the book and referenced this, the measure what matters. Measure what matters. Yeah. By John yeah, yeah. Thor. So, yeah. Yeah. We, if somebody like, is, if you look at our dashboard, yeah. we like just copied and pasted from that book, basically. Because it's a great book. And if yeah. so, I'll, I don't hear a lot of guys in the trades talk about that particular book. It's a fantastic resource. I'll link it in the show notes. But yeah, if you're if this OKR concept sounds good and the dashboarding, it sounds interesting to you. Totally reference it. It's similar. It's similar to like EOS sort of it's a scorecard in, uh, in some ways. Um, but and, yeah. And by, and by the way, like we've we've. Um, I, I imagine that many more of the folks that you speak with are either on EOS or Rockefeller Habits. Mm, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and like, those are great systems. And I'm, I tend to be system agnostic. It's more about having a system that you can stick to to create uh, that, visibility that's and accountability. It, yeah. It's the and, discipline. And, and, uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and OKRs was the right fit for our particular culture. That's why we went. Perfect. I yeah. totally buy it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The... And I would, yeah, I love that you actually said that too, because there's, there's a lot of great frameworks and a lot of great systems. And honestly, like my, or like we're EOS, this is, this is totally a sidebar. And one of my beefs with EOS is that it doesn't really do much that's novel, right? It's borrowing these ideas from all these different people. And it's like fantastic. Like, like Patrick Lencioni, flipping smart guy. And they just kind of like harvest his best ideas and throw yeah. it into EOS. Uh, Henry cloud, stupid, smart guy. They harvest his best ideas and pull it in the EOS. Uh, so it, it's not a lot of like, ooh, it does something new and unique and complicated. Nope. It's just doing basic things exceptionally well over and over and over. Exactly. And when you have that sort of discipline, like at that point, to your point, the, uh, you, can, you don't have to be a scholar in one platform or another or another because the, the kind of the framework and the process is what's driving the outcome. Um, it's that discipline. Um, yeah, that's the thing. 100%. Yeah. Um, this, this is such a fascinating thing. What, um, when you think about the, the business as it exists now and kind of like the road you have, like in the next two, three, four, five years, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges you have in front of you? Yeah, of course. So, so like the, the number one 
key challenge and like the the immediate fight and and if we and if we win that fight um it'll earn us the right to grow is like you know we we started in in uh in this business thinking that we would be primarily acquisitive and like the the thing about acquisitions is that yeah like you got to lay out some capital on the front but you're already buying a business that has a track record of profitability we've we've obviously like pivoted and intentionally have gone into a J curve and are investing in new market growth, which we're super excited about because we feel like we have the right talent to allow us to, to capture it, but we still have to be profitable. And so the number one goal is to achieve three consecutive profitable months in each of our, in each of our new markets uh, by the end of the calendar year. And profitability for us is just a, like, frankly, a lagging indicator of, uh, like, do we have a, a replicable business model or not? If if we come to believe that we have a replicable business model, as indicated by being able to achieve profitability somewhere near the end of, of year one, like that'll earn us the right to grow into a, a tranche of other new markets. Like this first time around, it was five. If we get really confident, maybe the next time it's 10. And, and like, let's assume that we you know, get through all the challenges uh, associated with like growing a novel business model in a bunch of new markets. If we get there and we earn the right to launch in a bunch of new places, frankly, like our biggest challenge, at least for me at that point will be like right now, every market president reports into me. Um, <clears throat> so that's seven people that report directly into me. And that's, that's not even including like the three people in our headquarters that report to me. So I have 10 direct reports, which is too many to begin with, but we can get away with it because of how much autonomy our market presidents have. When we grow again, uh, I certainly can't have 20 people reporting to me. And um, that'll necessitate either spending on a layer of middle management or reorganizing regionally, or th there's like a number of ways that we could tackle that, that challenge. Uh, but but thinking through, like just how we structure ourselves uh, and and continue momentum when we're at the next stage of growth is is certainly the biggest challenge coming. Yeah, that seems that seems crazy, and I'm I'm also curious to, uh, like, forgive me, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound a little bit like a cynic because there's there's a part of me that's like contrarian, yeah. like like no, if you were to be like, bro, this is the please. best ham sandwich I've ever had, I'd be like, really, bro, like the best ham sandwich, like. Part of me really likes the romance of the idea of like having all this autonomy and all this freedom and all this like self direction that you're as you're diluting down. Part of me goes like, but at some point that breaks. At some point that's that's not even a franchise. Like that's that's something where there's so there's so many variations and so much inconsistencies that it's hard to learn from best practices and deploy those things across the network to other markets as they come online. And right now it's like if it's five, it's like okay, cool, uh, doable. But if it's ten, if it's fifty, if it's a hundred, those those sort of things in, in in my mind, at some point they become like the enemy. That there's not the ability; it won't feel as boutique. It won't feel as as uh, consistent. It won't feel as established or premium or reliable because it's going to be like up to the unique personality of whoever's there. So I'm curious, like, how long do you think you'll be able to maintain that sort of like independent? Um, hyper entrepreneurial sort of approach that you allow the presidents to have at this point versus how much do you think, Hey, at some point there's going to be some amount of standardization. There's going to be some amount of SOP consolidation. There's going to be some amount of like, this is the way we as an organization do things, not just the values we share, which I love that you lead with that. It's unbelievably important. But at what point do you feel like, Hey, these things actually become not a strength, they actually become something that works against us that you would have to solve at that point. Does that make sense? No, it, it totally does. So like, I'll, I'll answer the question in, in two ways. Uh, the, the first is like, I was able to hire, and I'm happy to get into like the specific process we use to hire these people, uh, if that's a direction you wanna go in. But like, I did five this time. And like, it's an open question if doing 10 and finding people of the same high quality is doable. Assuming it is, which is a really, really strong assumption, um, that still leaves open the question of what about systems and what about standardization? And like, I haven't really focused on it in this 
conversation, but like each of our markets uh, does operate uh, according to the same playbook, uh, operates in the same technology system. Uh, like there is a healthy amount of standardization. With that being said, even in all of the technology that we've invested in and the SOPs and the playbooks that we've built, like we focus on, on like a 80, 20 principle. And so like the, the environment in which we've built our technology is a low code environment. Um, it, it doesn't require uh, software engineers to like make edits. You or I with an hour of training could figure out how to make edits. And, and the reason we do that is because we tell our market presidents that like the software and operational solutions that we're handing you are going to be an 80% solution. And we want to hire people that are, that are, that are invigorated at the idea uh, that they get to go the last mile on their own. Um, oh, that totally makes sense. W- while at the same time, like holding them to some specific standards, like as an example, I brought up that like weekly update email that has accountability of what's happened in your home over the last 90 days and what's going to come in the, in the next 90 days. That doesn't just like happen on its own. That happens because we have a system that, you know, that is standardized across every market that uh, keeps accountability of every customer, every job that we do for every customer internally, every job that we have a sub on for each customer by date and by service status. Uh, and unless that system is kept rigorously up to date, then we're not, th- then like there's, there's no value being created by our, by our additional charge. It's like when you go with our company, it is more expensive than if you call the plumber on your own. And so uh, like typically our management fee is 20%. And so if we're going to be around 20% more expensive, it ends up being a little bit less than that because our, because we push our subs a lot of work. They typically give us discounted rates. Um, but let's just say it's 20%. If we're 20% more expensive, our business breaks uh, if our customers don't feel like they're getting way more than 20% in increased value. Um, yeah, and so that comes with systemization. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. I track with you there. That's that's absolutely like the luxury sort of thing, right? Like, like Roos Chris has no problem selling 100 or two or $300 stakes, right? Now, they would have a really, really hard time selling a $100 like uh, Outback quality stake. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah. like they they just wouldn't be able to compete selling an inferior product for a premium price point. So I, I the way you're thinking about it makes sense. It's such a it's such a fascinating model, and I'm really curious to see how you continue to like spool up these other markets. If somebody like wants to learn more about you, like pick your brain, like w- even want to become a part of like consideration for as you continue to expand, yeah. what's the best way for somebody to reach you, man? Yeah, so um, I'm I'm like very very rigorous about. Um, responding to every email. Like I, one of my, one of my, um, one of my theories about talent recruitment is that like, you can have the best strategies in the world, but at the end of the day, talent recruitment is about execution. And like, you just have to rigorously follow up with every single lead. So if you email me, I will respond to you and I will respond to you very, very quickly. Uh, so if you're, uh, like eager to grow something from scratch and have the discipline and wherewithal to take a little bit of risk, drop like balanced out with the fact that you'll get a nice salary, really great profit sharing, and have the opportunity to to grow a business in a place in a community that you love. Uh, my my email address is Jason at nfhomeservices.com, which I'm sure Ryan will put uh, in in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, if you if you email me, you'll you'll get a response. I, dude, I, I'm really, I mean, it's such a cool idea. The way you're kind of scaling it is really, really interesting and exciting. I hope you have tons and tons of success. I can't wait to see you go. I will make sure your your emails and the show notes. I'll also link your website and all the things. Thank you. Dude, thanks for stopping by. Congrats on all the success. Uh, and I'm so glad that you're able to build a life, like build a business that helps you support your own goals, like in having your family, including your kiddo, in your basement, in Jersey. Like all the best to you, man. Keep it up. Thanks so much, Ryan. Be well. Really appreciate the conversation. This episode was hosted by Ryan Redding, author of the book on digital marketing for plumbing and HVAC contractors, and founder of Leveragey, the digital marketing solution for serious home service companies. You can subscribe to Blue Collar CEO on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit us online at bluecollar.ceo and find us on Instagram 
And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another awesome episode. See you soon. Bye.